there is a dark force in the sky. A black tower of wind. A long shadow of fear across the American prairie. It looks just like a boiling mass, like a monster, like something that's almost alive. Any tornado is a rare and awesome sight, but some are rarer still. Storms that are one in a thousand, packing 300 mile an hour winds. This is a disaster area, disaster area, we need help. It was just terrible. I've, I've never seen anything like it and I don't want to again. And above all others, the tri-state tornado of 1925. In sheer killing power, it was more than double the size of any other U.S. tornado. In many other ways, it was the most mysterious of the breed. Perhaps it's a one in 500 year event, one in a thousand year event. This is the story of the most fearsome tornado that ever prowled the earth. If the twister is the great American storm, this was its 4th of July. In an almost forgotten time, people used to watch the sky the same way we watch television and computer screens today. At least, Jane Alban Cruz did. We would sit out on my front porch and make figures out of clouds in the sky. That's all we knew. But she never saw the mysterious dark cloud that carried away her school, her town, and parts of three states. How I got out, I don't know. Few who saw the great funnel cloud would live to tell about it, but other twisters have left spellbound audiences. The first Europeans in North America were astonished by fearful apparitions from the sky. They had many names for them, whirlwinds, cyclones, tempests, the finger of God. From the Spanish came the name that stuck, El Tornado, or the Spiral. They occur in most countries of the world and every state in the Union, but their preferred haunt is the American Great Plains, the atmospheric mixing bowl known as Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is a prolific uh, severe weather and tornado producing region of the world because it's a region where tropical moisture from the Gulf of Mexico intersects drier air that floods out of the desert southwest and the Rocky Mountain chain. Its silhouette against a prairie landscape is one of the most mesmerizing sights in nature. Its spinning vortex has long made Hollywood screenwriters dizzy with ideas. Even astronomers have found inspiration in the twister. In the mechanics of its spiraling motion, they see a blueprint for the creation of galaxies. The tornadoes are a cosmic experience. It's the cosmic forces of the universe. It's not an impact of a comet on Jupiter. It's not a supernova in another galaxy. It's right here. Yet where tornadoes have crossed paths with people, there is one overriding reaction. Primitive terror. The strongest building shook as if tossed with an earthquake. The air was black with whirling eddies of house walls, roofs, chimneys, huge timbers torn from distant ruins, all shot through the air as if thrown from a mighty catapult. Henry Tooley, Natchez, 1840. The Natchez storm of 1840 may be the most perfect example of a storm in the wrong place at the wrong time. The tornado came up the Mississippi River a mile wide at a point where the Mississippi is a mile wide. So it encompassed the entire river and a good part of the town. At least 317 deaths were counted on the river and at Natchez. It was America's worst natural disaster to date. In 
In some parts, it's still called a cyclone, but what hit St. Louis in 1896 was actually a very large and deadly tornado. It smashed blocks of wooden houses, tore the roofs off factories and churches, and killed almost 300 in St. Louis alone. But then it got worse. Choked with debris and water, the tornado gathered power as it crossed the Mississippi. There's a possibility that an additional 100 people died in that tornado on Mississippi River boats, and the bodies were never found. Across the river, East St. Louis was hit hardest of all. Buildings there lost more than their roofs. The walls were ripped down, the debris carried away. This is the signature of the most violent of tornadoes, a four or five on the Fujita scale. F1 tornado or a zero tornado will blow down a tree or a sign, flip over a mobile home. That's at one end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, a well-built home is left as a swath across the prairie at F5. The F5 is both the rarest and most destructive of all storms. Almost 30 years would go by before America would see another catastrophic F5. The crescent of Illinois, south of St. Louis, has long been known as Egypt. Anybody who reads the Bible attentively knows full well that Egypt does not get good press in the Bible. It is a region of darkness, of ignorance, of superstition, of oppression. In the 1920s, the Egypt of southern Illinois wasn't getting good press either. It was the northern stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan. Local Klansmen were known for wearing their white robes and hoods to church. Even more brazen were Egypt's gangsters and bootleggers. Their roadhouses roared, and so did their guns. In the central county of Williamson, murders were so frequent that it became known as Bloody Williamson. It was a time of uh, lawlessness, of corruption of uh, government officials. Some would interpret the horrible events that were about to take place as a judgment upon the sins of Egypt. Divine vengeance, it seemed, was kicking up in the wind. There were also plenty of honest working people in this part of America. Farmers soldiered on despite hard times. The recovery of European farming from World War I had made crop prices fall everywhere else. But coal mining was booming. Men who earned a living in the mines counted themselves lucky, particularly on March 18, 1925. You couldn't do much better on that day than be deep underground in a mine shaft. If a devastating tornado was on its way, there was no sign in the sky. In Annapolis, Missouri, there was typical spring weather. Patches of blue mixed in with rain clouds. This was not a day where people walked out and said, gee, the sky is really ugly looking, it's very windy, and we're going to get a bad storm today. And all of a sudden, this very, very strange light falls over everything. Through the windows of the Annapolis schoolhouse, the sky darkened to a deep charcoal, as it will on a spring day. Bernice Jones and her classmates heard a seemingly familiar sound. Like a train, like a heavy loaded train that was really pulling. But the rapidly approaching sound wasn't that of a train. At that moment, Bernice's father was 450 feet underground in the lead mine. There was a faint rumbling overhead, followed by total power failure. The miners were stranded in darkness. A narrow staircase, their only route to daylight. No hoist, 450 feet. They would start a man, and they had landings every so often, you know. Slowly, Bernice's father and the other miners emerged from the black hole completely unprepared for what they were about to see. Devastation. He said he just, he just couldn't believe his eyes. 
You just couldn't imagine how that could happen. A giant tornado had touched down in the wilderness a few miles away and had made a terrible visitation upon the little town. It came over the ridge, just swept through the town and took most of the town away with it. Mysteriously, there were no reports of a funnel cloud at Annapolis. What witnesses saw was something that looked like a dark, ground-hugging fog. It didn't look particularly menacing or anything. It, it just looked like fog rolling along the hills. The mysterious fog left Annapolis and swallowed the tiny community of Beeley, Missouri, going on to the floodplain of the Mississippi River, where again, witnesses recalled a tumbling black cloud. It looks just like a boiling mass, like a monster, like something that's almost alive. Legend has it that the Great Twister parted the Mississippi as it crossed, and that on the Illinois side of the river, it rained fish. Stranger things would soon follow, and more horrible, for the tri-state tornado had only started its deadly work. There were still two more states to cross. On a March day in 1925, a mysterious black cloud crossed a lonely stretch of the Mississippi River. On the other side, the luckless river town of Gorham, Illinois. In the floodplain of the Mississippi, Gorham was accustomed to periodic damage from the elements. But nothing like this demolished the whole town, killed a whole lot of people there. It wasn't the first town it killed people in, but this is the first town where it killed a lot of people. It was all over in a few moments. At 60 miles an hour, the cloud was moving at twice the normal speed of a tornado. 60 miles per hour was not a speed back then that people associated with anything. But certainly the cars didn't go that fast, what few of them there were. Most people still had horses and buggies. Gorham never really knew what hit it. And 10 miles away, a much larger town never knew what was coming. Murfreesboro was a coal shipping center, a thriving city of 12,000. Its biggest worry at that moment was the bank robbery that had taken place the day before. $1,500 had been looted from the Ava State Bank by two teenaged gunmen. It was suspected to be an amateur job. Though the county was overrun with gangsters, few of them would stoop to something like bank robbery. There was just too much money to be made selling illegal booze. That afternoon, children filled the classrooms of the John A. Logan School, which had been condemned a year earlier. The soft bricks used in its 1884 construction were now thought to be unsafe. The school was set to be bulldozed at the end of the school year. At 2.45 p.m. on March 18th, the students were in class, many of them looking out the west windows at a very unusual sky. Suddenly, one of those windows was ripped from the wall. A pane of glass sailed right across the room, hit the blackboard, and just splattered. Seconds later, the roof flew away. Walls disappeared into the sky. Seven children died in the wreckage of Logan School. Fortunately, much of the soft brick had simply been carried away instead of falling into the classrooms. This was one of the safer places to be. A mile wide and moving a mile a minute, the tornado ripped through the northwest side of Murfreesboro. There was no warning, no time to take cover. Warning sirens were not yet in use, and all phone lines to the west were down. But that wasn't the only problem. Thing was, it just didn't look like a tornado. There was nothing to give any indication that this was a tornado until it got very, very close and people saw pieces of houses and trees in it. 
pieces of trees in the air, pieces of buildings. And then by this time, you know something's very wrong. In parts of Murfreesboro, nothing was left standing except a few denuded trees, bodies draped over branches. Buildings were turned into kindling. With the tornado destroyed, fire would consume. 234 people were dead, and much of the town was turned into airborne debris, swept along by the twister as it exited town. It was on a fateful path, northeast along the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy rail line, making a sound not unlike a giant coal train. The twister now barreled along the same track. In its way, a place called DeSoto, a nondescript small town that would nevertheless soon be known throughout the land. Jane Alban Cruz was then in the fourth grade. The girl who loved clouds was the daughter of the town banker and general store operator. The Albans were one of the prominent families in this village of 1600. At 2.50 that afternoon, Jane was in her fourth grade class. Her future husband, Garrett, was in eighth grade. School would be out in less than 10 minutes. Jane and Garrett were still at their desks when the twister struck. The next thing I recall, I was in the coal bin, buried in coal. Through his classroom window, Garrett Cruz watched a girl who was late in returning to class. I happened to look at the right time. I just saw her for an instant, but I didn't see her off the ground moving horizontally over the ground. She was later found dead, rolled up in a, in a wire fence, which bounded the north side of our school ground. 37 other children died in the twisted ruins of the schoolhouse. Never had a tornado killed so many children in one place in the U.S. And the rest of DeSoto was hit just as badly. Well, it just looked like it was a mess. It just, you couldn't tell it was DeSoto. The degree of devastation was just unbelievable. Uh, the path at that point was a mile wide. Uh, some places even a little more than a mile. DeSoto was just wiped off the map. Dolly Swabel's grandmother was blown from her grandfather's embrace. Well, he said he was holding her with all of his strength. And that wind just sucked her right out of his arms. Amid the ruins of the Alban Bank and General Store, almost the only thing left untouched was the electric wall clock stopped at 2.50. Another 12 miles up the tracks was West Frankfurt. The gritty coal mining town was bracing itself, though not for a tornado. The Ku Klux Klan was about to stage a rally nearby. The Klan was a lightning rod for the area's anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant sentiment. Its ad for the rally contained a curious turn of phrase, everybody welcome. But something was on its way that would steal the Klan's thunder. Deep beneath West Frankfurt, the coal mines were suddenly plunged into darkness. The ground shook to a distant train-like roar. And the miners emerged from the coal shafts to a grotesquely disfigured world. The town's water tower had been hurled partly into the ground. 40-ton rail cars were scattered like model trains. One freight car deposited neatly atop a line of Model Ts. And where the miners' houses had stood, scenes of cruel devastation. Not only is the house destroyed to where there's nothing left standing, not a single wall, but the debris carried away. So it just looks like something came in, blew everything up, and bulldozed it. Engorged with debris, the twister moved into the farmlands of southeastern Illinois. The misery of a nationwide depression in agriculture was now compounded by the tornado. Farm after farm was just swept away. People didn't know what was coming. 
It was a huge black mass. People thought it might have been just a big dust storm. They had no idea that there was a monster tornado three quarters of a mile wide on the other side of that dust. Farmers who were very weather wise, and normally in uh, US history, it is very rare to have a farm owner die. 30 farm owners died in that tornado. The tornado crossed the Wabash River at 4 p.m., smashing into Indiana at the river town of Griffin. By this time, there were general reports of a rope-like funnel cloud. The rope stage of a tornado is both its last and most dramatic. The twisted serpentine shape usually means the tornado is dying. But 200 miles after touching down, this storm was still a killer. 58 people died at Griffin. Hundreds more were trapped beneath the ruins. Then, in a final cruel twist of fate, the tornado made a sudden detour. If it had kept the north 60 degrees east heading that it had, uh, it would not have hit any more towns after Griffin. The storm killed nine people outside Owensville, then made a left turn, making straight for the large town of Princeton. Between Griffin and Princeton, the tornado was traveling at 73 miles per hour, which is close to a record for forward velocity. The tornado killed 44 more people at Princeton, then headed outbound for the still larger town of Petersburg. But in a nameless field west of Petersburg, the twister suddenly vanished. Like almost everything about this storm, it made its exit in mysterious fashion. No one saw it come and no one saw it go. I suppose what happened is the circulation just drew in and it just, poof, gone. In the Twister's wake was a 219 mile long river of ruin and a trough of low pressure into which cold air now surged. There was to be one more freak of weather in store for this March day in the lower Midwest. It snowed. March 19th, 1925. The power was out at the offices of the Murfreesboro Daily Independent. The resourceful editors were left to handset their single-page edition of the day. Storm and fire dead, 125 here at 8 p.m. More bodies reaching morgue hourly. DeSoto dead reported, 118. School collapsed at 2.30. Town flat. A lot of thick black headlines and superlatives would be issued about the great tornado of 1925. But this brief document remains perhaps the most chilling. Some people talked about thinking that before the cloud was upon them that maybe it was the end of the world. And I suppose that after the tornado had left, they had no reason to think that it had not been the end of the world. It's certainly the end of their world. We'd always talk what happened before the tornado and what happened after, because our, our life completely changed. In the scattered debris of what had been Gorham, 34 people lay dead. Much of Murfreesboro was reduced to ashes. After being flattened, the northwest side of the town had burned. The tornado alone had engineered the destruction of DeSoto. What was left of the town was barely recognizable. We went out the graveyard and there's 22 graves open. One grave, it buried three, the dad and mother and the daughter. In West Frankfurt, an undertaker collapsed from exhaustion over his lunch. He had been burying tornado victims for 36 hours straight. Most of them wasn't held over, you know, like they are for funerals now because there were so many of them. Dolly Swable had already lost her grandmother, blown from her grandfather's arms. Now her older sister was missing. 
Newly married and six weeks pregnant, she had talked to a storekeeper before taking cover. She said, look, don't that cloud look bad? I sure am scared. And went back in her house, and that's, she's the last one that ever talked to my sister. The woman was missing for six days. When she was found, there was only one way of knowing for sure. Perform an autopsy to see, and uh, found out she was pregnant. She was blowed over into the GM and old yards and burnt. It was just so cloudy and black, you couldn't see anything, even as it was going through the disorder. Dorothy Raymond was one of the few eyewitnesses of the actual funnel cloud. She saw the black pillar of debris as it moved from Murfreesboro to DeSoto, passing within a quarter mile of her family farm, causing no damage and no injuries. The real toll of the storm didn't hit home to her until later, on a visit to a funeral home to identify a badly disfigured neighbor. I ran out of the building when I saw Mr. Elmore, and then I got in behind the door and ran in them dead bodies, and I wasn't used to that. As many as 695 people were killed by the black cloud, more than twice the death toll of any other U.S. tornado. Among the survivors, the bone saw reaped its grim harvest. Most often, it assisted in cutting people away from their shattered houses. Mixed in with the debris were many unattached arms and legs. There were the usual stories of freak phenomena that are associated with tornadoes. Straw was driven into solid wood. Live trees were impaled clean through by two by fours. In a house in Murfreesboro, the tornado parked a car on the second floor. On March 21st, the Murfreesboro Daily Independent published its first full edition since the tornado. Rebuild Murfreesboro, the headline and tone. Unquenchable spirit of hometown victorious over embers of woe. The towns would rebuild, but they would never again be quite the same. The 1925 tornado was followed a few years later by the Great Depression, stunting the growth of the region. Murfreesboro took a crippling blow when the railroad failed to rebuild. The burnt m and yards were declared a total loss. Even the tracks were ripped out of the ground. To this day, Murfreesboro's population remains below the level of 1925. But the deepest scar left by the tornado wasn't on the land. It was on the mind. There's always the belief that if a tornado, like the devastating one of 1925, can strike, it can strike again, and that uh, there is something foreordained about the path of that tornado. The first efforts at rebuilding were revealing. It wasn't new homes and stores that people built first. It was storm cellars. There was a horror of the black cloud's return. Any kind of cloud at all that was the least bit dark, or especially if it was on the horizon where they couldn't get a real good look at it, was cause for great dread. It was wise to keep an eye on the clouds in the days ahead. The decades after the 1925 storm would see the worst outbreaks of tornadoes in history including a record 148 twisters that touched down in a single day. The deadliest power ever to come from the sky was on its way. But this time, Tornado Alley would be ready. Than the sheer force of 300 mile an hour winds, twisters kill by surprise. And through the 1940s, Tornado Alley was almost always taken by surprise. There seemed no way to predict them, 
And the only warning came with the roar of the wind and the sight of an unearthly cloud swirling with debris. That all changed in one week in 1948 with a remarkable double stroke of luck and inspiration. We needed an event to push forecasting. And these are the guys that had the technique. And where does the tornado form? Right in front of their nose. Captain Robert Miller and Major Ernest Faubish, Air Force weathermen with some untested notions about the origins of tornadoes. Two people in the right place at the right time. On May 20th, 1948, a tornado touched down on the runway at Tinker Air Force Base near Oklahoma City. 50 large aircraft were destroyed. While the base cleaned up the mess in the ground, Fawbush and Miller were looking at the sky. After a long, long week of intensive investigation and research and all the rest, came up with a forecast technique for tornadoes that really holds water today. Weather balloons the day of the tornado had spotted a distinctive atmospheric pattern. Both humid and dry air were associated with a low pressure area and a handful of other conditions. Were these the fingerprints of tornado producing clouds? Fawbush and Miller had their suspicions, but needed a chance to confirm them. As it happened, they didn't have long to wait. Just five days later, severe thunderstorms again gathered over the runway. The base commander wasn't about to lose any more aircraft to tornadoes. He ordered his meteorologists to consult their instruments and, if necessary, to issue a warning. The odds of two tornadoes hitting the same spot within the same week are astronomical. Yet, there in the thunderclouds was the same combination of humidity, dryness, and low pressure. Fawbush and Miller then took the forecasting gamble of the century. They issued a tornado warning. The way tornadoes are forecast today, had that tornado hit 50 miles north of the base or 50 miles south of the base, it probably would have been considered a successful forecast, much less on the base. On the Air Force Base is exactly where the second twister touched down. But this time, the aircraft were secured, and there was little damage. The stunning success of Fawbush and Miller revolutionized meteorology. In a few short years, their severe weather forecasting techniques were accepted nationwide. They would soon make the difference between life and death in Tornado Alley. devastating series of tornadoes in many decades rips through six Midwestern states. In the wake of the twisters, there are nearly 250 people dead, with damages mounting to the hundreds of millions of dollars. Iowa, Wisconsin, Arkansas, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan were all hard hit by the deadly tornadoes as they slashed across the heart of the Midwest. This was the aftermath of Palm Sunday, 1965. Not a single storm this time but a large tornado family called an outbreak. Altogether, 51 twisters touched down on that day and the next. Sirens echoed from Alabama to Illinois. Deadly funnel clouds seemed to be everywhere. But the 65 outbreak was nothing like what would happen just nine years later. A scourge of tornadoes, three times the size of the Palm Sunday outbreak. There's certain outbreaks that you can see coming in the April 3rd, 74 outbreak. Uh, they could see coming. All the conditions were there just at the right time. Extreme humidity gripped large areas of the country. Unstable air was moving in. Ominous thunderclouds were massing. The sky was pregnant with tornadoes. Then they started touching down wave after wave of deadly twisters. 913914, we have a touchdown, 5800 West Fork, extensive damage, vehicles screaming for help. This is a disaster area, disaster area, there are lives ready and we need help. Huntsville, Alabama, 
in the tracks of a 51-mile-long twister that decimated a trailer park and filled the hospitals with wounded. One injured man was taken to a church to await a ride to the hospital, only to be overtaken by a second tornado a half hour later, which killed him. This whole neighborhood, uh, Hutchison Road, has been wiped out. Houses leveled, wires, poles, and uh, power down. You better send everything you can get over here. Ten people were killed at Louisville when a twister sideswiped the city. But a suburb called Brandenburg was hit point blank. Brandenburg was all but wiped out. 31 people lost their lives. Saw what I thought to be smoke and stuff coming up over the hill, but it was a black cloud or wind, dirt, and everything coming up over the hill. And it just hit, and that's it. In Indiana, there were 16 tornadoes on the ground at the same time. The National Weather Service gave up a county-by-county county alert. Instead, they issued an unprecedented blanket warning. The whole state was advised to take cover. In Xenia, Ohio, a high school student took this film while three funnel clouds converged on the town. The deadliest single tornado out of almost 150. It was just a big roar, and I, I don't know. It was just terrible. It sounded like a big train whistle, and we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it, and I don't want to again. Xenia had some of the most appalling damage of the outbreak, some of the worst loss of life, and many of the now familiar freaks of tornado force winds. Thirty-four people were killed here, but many others were saved by early warnings. The sirens caused the high school drama team to cut their rehearsals short. Seconds later, two school buses landed on the stage where they had been practicing. It took weeks to assess the damage and document the touchdowns. Only then did scientists realize the enormity of what had occurred. An unprecedented 148 separate tornadoes, a record number of F4 and F5 tornadoes, record miles of tornado destruction. The death toll was 315, which significantly wasn't anywhere near a record. Heaven knows what the super outbreak death toll would have been had it occurred 50 years ago. 3,000 deaths, 1,500 deaths, and not unlikely at all. As it was, 315 people died, less than half the number of the tri-state tornado of 1925. Perhaps science had put the brakes on runaway death tolls from tornadoes. This was never more evident than when the warnings failed to come. The sirens came at 3.51 p.m. On the afternoon of August 28, 1990, the skies over northern Illinois convulsed with thunderstorms. In parts of the Chicago area, residents were advised to take cover. A tornado could be imminent. But the warning came too late. More than a half hour before the sirens, an immense funnel cloud touched down on the Chicago suburb of Plainfield. By then it was a done deal. The storm uh, retreated rapidly to the southeast and was gone by that time from the area that had been so devastated by it. Bodies were thrown into nearby cornfields. Semis were overturned. Their trailers lobbed a hundred yards away. The steeple of St. Mary's Catholic Church hurled to the ground. At Plainfield High School, the administration building was obliterated. The school itself was hit with the staff inside. Two teachers and a janitor were killed. It could have been much worse. The very next day, the school year was scheduled to begin. Had the tornado come a day later, 1,000 students would have been inside this building. As it was, 28 people had died 
and over 300 were injured. All right, we lived. Why had the warning come after the tornado? The weather service had spotted the potential for tornadoes as early as one o'clock, two hours before the touchdown, but then they hesitated. Lately, they had come under fire for issuing too many warnings, most of which were followed by a funnel cloud that failed to touch down or by no tornado at all. If you keep issuing a tornado warning for a particular area over and over again, and people don't feel there's been a tornado, even though it may have occurred somewhere nearby, uh, then you've essentially, in the eyes of these people who haven't seen the tornado, cried wolf. The tragedy added a new phrase to the weatherman's lexicon. It's called the Plainfield Syndrome, that it's better to issue too many warnings than one too few. It has also showed that 65 years after the tri-state tornado, the ways of the twister remained mysterious and largely unpredictable. Even today, the great tornado of 1925 baffles meteorologists. Many believe that it could not have been a single storm. Tornadoes aren't supposed to last for four hours and cover over 200 miles. There is no meteorological explanation for it. A supercell thunderstorm, as we understand it, can't do that. It just can't produce a 200-mile path. I find it awfully hard to believe that was one single tornado. And I've talked to a lot of my colleagues who spend a lot of their time working with severe weather who feel the same way. Many believe that it was three or four separate funnels growing out of each other. On the other hand, it seemed to leave the tracks of a lone killer. There was no evidence anywhere that the damage ever abated. And I think it would be a remarkable coincidence for a multi-tornado family to have been able to sustain an unbroken damage path throughout that whole distance. There's no room in the present state of the art of meteorology for a single tornado of this size, so it remains a paradox. And what if the great funnel cloud should one day return? Would another 700 die? Or would the wide use of radar, satellites, and sirens produce a different outcome? I think the storm would show up on radar as such a spectacular entity that every siren, every police car in, across southern Illinois and Indiana would be blaring an hour ahead of time. Every TV station, every radio station would let people know that this thing is coming. If that tornado had happened today, yes, early warning systems would have saved lives. Uh, the fatality account would not have been nearly 700, but it still could have been half of that. Seven decades after it passed, the tri-state tornado is still wrapped in mystery. Was it one storm or many? Will we see its equal or was it a unique event, a phenomenon that occurs perhaps once in five centuries? And the now elderly survivors of that long ago March afternoon still look at the clouds in the sky searching for a sign that the dark enigma will once again descend on the towns and schools of Tornado Alley.